Um, but I wanted to share a chapter that I thought was timely called The Other Side of Harmony. Much like my elementary school, the Catholic high school I attended was predominantly white. But then there were enough students of color to fill multiple, oh. But by then there were enough students of color to fill multiple tables at lunch, form a gospel choir, and generally make our presence known. To tell the truth, I don't remember any major, major racial incidents happening in any of the four years I was there. No swastikas on bathroom stalls, no fistfights prompted by an overconfident white boy using the N-word, no blackface parties or inappropriate Halloween costumes. For the most part, we all existed in harmony. But there were a few key moments in which I learned that harmony, or the absence of outright conflict, often leaves deeper complications untouched. Miss Phillips' classroom was a favorite for students. She was short with a square frame and a foul mouth, which was intriguing since she taught our religion class. She mostly donned mom jeans and oversized shirts. That sounds great. Anyway, she had a big laugh and told big stories. And as she taught from behind her podium, her energy filled the room. Ms. Phillips gave us life, life lessons right alongside the curriculum. And sometimes instead of her curriculum, she told us about living in community with other single women, sharing resources, prioritizing friendships and intimacy. There was nothing we couldn't ask her. One day, after Ms. Phillips told us about her fear of ghosts, we stole the remote to the classroom TV and spent the class period turning it off and on. At first, Ms. Phillips had us made, convinced we had figured out a way to control the television. But as the class wore on and the TV continued turning on and off, she started testing it. If you are my uncle, turn off now, she countered. Off went the TV. She turned to us, eyes wide, and kept testing it by calling out the names of dead relatives. Minutes later, when we burst into laughter and revealed the truth, she wasn't mad at all. In fact, she dubbed us the best class she ever had. One day, it was Miss Phillips who caught us off guard. As we filed into our classroom, she announced she would no longer use a seating chart. For the first time, we scanned the room deciding where we wanted to sit. Once we were settled, she informed us that she wanted to share why we suddenly had been given permission to choose our seats. There was something uncharacteristically soft about the way she spoke. Every year, I use a seating chart, she began, deciding where each of you will sit. Earlier this week, I realized that my tendency to do this is racist. I froze. There was another classroom in which I was perhaps one of three. Oh, this was another classroom in which I was perhaps one of three students of color. I had no idea what was coming next, but I suddenly became very aware of my body. You see, she continued, I have been using a seating chart to separate black students. I didn't fully realize it until I failed to separate two black young women in one of my classes. When I saw them together, I panicked, thinking, Great, now they're gonna laugh and talk through the entire period. She paused. She was clearly overwhelmed, yet making an effort to be as forthcoming as she would be about anything else. She did not mince words or sugarcoat any part of her thinking. And that's when I realized what I was doing was racist. I have never ever wondered if any of my white students were gonna be disruptive. I've never been nervous to find two white girls sitting next to one another. I'm so disappointed with myself, and from now on, you will all sit where you want to sit. She took a deep breath, and so did I. I'm guessing there were plenty of classes in which Ms. Phillips had to separate two white students for being disruptive. However, by her own admission, this tendency towards disruption was never attributed to their race. Only when the disruptive students were black did race become a defining factor. While I was grateful that she'd had an epiphany, or at least wanted to be grateful, mm, that part, that part, Austin, or at least wanted to be grateful, the revelation made me incredibly self-conscious. I thought so much of Miss Phillips. I, want, I wasn't prepared to hear what she had thought of me, of my body. The stereotype about sassy, disrespectful black girls was not lost on me. But until then, I had thought it was just a convenient movie trope. I didn't realize it could be used against me. 
I looked around the classroom to gauge the response of other students. No one had much to add. I think most of them were just glad to be able to sit wherever they wanted. But I was having an entirely different experience. Should I have been glad for my teacher's aha moment? Did it make me safer in her classroom now that she was aware of her bias? What about the other teachers at my school? Were they, even the ones I liked, watching me, judging me? It was the first time I saw beyond my own perception of the racial harmony at my school. I was grateful that I didn't have to deal with overt acts of racism, but was it better to know that teachers silently believed I would be a nuisance unless I proved otherwise? How could I know if beneath other amicable interactions, the stereotypes and biases of those in power were operating against students who look like me? This moment of disappointment made me even more determined to assert agency over my academic life. For the most part, my defiance manifested itself in demanding the right to explore blackness. Book report due, I was choosing a black author. History paper assigned, black history was the only option for me. Like many black students in predominantly white schools, if I wanted to see myself reflected in the curriculum, I had to act on my own behalf. Resisting an education built on a white worldview meant constantly having to evaluate the risks of telling the truth or furthering the myth. Would I write that Christopher Columbus, quote, discovered America? Would I do the report on Malcolm X instead of Mark Twain? My parents left the decision to me. I could choose the better grade or I could choose to affirm blackness. It's a decision many students of color have to make. Sometimes I just stated the truth. Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue in, 19, in 1492. I always do that. <laughs> 1492. But the land he discovered was already inhabited. Other times I would give the answer the teacher wanted with a disclaimer. Quote, our textbook states that, end quote. I won't lie, I kind of enjoyed being more right than my teachers, even if it cost me a half a letter grade. So it was a rare gift when I could walk into a classroom that didn't require this kind of work from me. Mr. Slavinsky's class was like that. Mr. Slavinsky was my freshman English teacher and the first to expose me to the power of an intentionally diverse curriculum. He was short, white, and full of energy. Whether natural or from coffee, we couldn't tell. He kept a warm pot in his classroom at all times. On the first day of class, Mr. Slee, Sly. I'm going to say Sly because it's S-L-I. I I didn't know we were shortening it. I wish I had a a fanatical. Anyway, Mr. Sly informed us that his goal for the year was to give us a headache from thinking so hard. And he often succeeded. There were passionate discussions of Richard Connell's The Most Dangerous Game, line-by-line readings of Shakespeare, and assignments to analyze the character development in Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca. Through all of this, Mr. Slavinsky inspired us to interrogate the assumptions we held about culture, ethics, laws. He wanted us to color outside the lines of our black and white thinking. Mr. Slavinsky's lesson plans would follow our textbook for a few weeks and then break away for the sake of diversity. One of those breakaways was a unit on poetry. Each day, Mr. Slavinsky printed out poems he'd selected, instructing us to read them and mark up the page. What words stood out? What did we notice about the structure? How did the content make us feel? One day, Mr. Slavinsky passed out a poem entitled, We Wear the Mask. I started reading immediately. The author's name, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, was familiar to me. My stepmom worked as a high school English teacher and was always eager to recite black poetry to me, so I knew we were about to read a poem about the black experience. Still, my eyes widened as I read the words. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. A mask, my mind raced, wondering how often I did this without much thought. Were there parts of me that I kept buried from white people, even the ones I counted as friends? Things did feel different when I was the only black girl in the class versus when I was surrounded by blackness at the lunch table or in our gospel choir. When I finished the poem, I felt both relieved and saddened. Mm, That, relieved and saddened. Mm. I looked up at Mr. Slavinsky wondering, 
how do you know? When I realized he was about to open up the floor for discussion, I folded myself into the chair, trying to make my body smaller, trying to disappear. Will you make me explain this? Will you ask me to tell this all-white class about the masks black people wear? I was surprised by my own reaction. It felt deeply gratifying to have my own experience named, lifted up, discussed, considered worthy of everyone's attention. And yet I had no desire to be the black spokesperson. It felt too risky. I wasn't sure that my classmates had earned the right to know, to understand, to be given access to such a vulnerable place in my experience. For me, this was more than an educational exercise. This is how we survive. It's a common conundrum for black children navigating mostly white classrooms. It is often expected, both by the other students and by the teacher, that black students will have no problem acting as the race experts for their classrooms. Eventually, though, we begin to question whether we'll be safe when the subject comes up, or if we even have the right to speak on behalf of all black people. I mean, it's not like we have a committee meeting every Wednesday night to decide what we think about any given issue. But my first reaction in this moment possessed none of these thoughts. I simply wasn't interested in taking off the mask. Fortunately, Mr. Slavinsky didn't call on me to respond to Dunbar's words. Though we had not exchanged one word since the exercise began, I sensed that he respected my decision to keep my thoughts private. I listened in amusement as white students, many of whom possessed an intellect and creativity that I sincerely admired, attempted to interpret the poem. No matter how well reasoned their responses, they just couldn't know. But that didn't stop Mr. Slavinsky from challenging them. I was grateful that my teacher was equipped to navigate that conversation without making me the momentary substitute teacher. Mr. Slavinsky already had my respect, but that day he also gained my trust. He was able to redraw the boundaries of our comfort zone. Breaking the social policy of just ignoring race didn't have to end badly. I wished he could steer discussions in every classroom. I remember a religion class toward the end of my senior year when our teacher asked the students about, future, about our future plans. Most of us were bound for college in the fall, so the conversation gravitated toward talk of applications, scholarships, and possible majors. A discussion that led one white classmate to air her grievances about not being accepted to the University of Michigan. Rather than chalking it up to the sheer number of applicants U of M must receive in any given year, she had a different explanation. A black person must have taken her place. And not a black person who perhaps had above average test scores, who'd completed more hours of community service or perhaps had written a stronger biographical essay on the application. Had this been her assumption about the black people who earned spots at the university, I probably could have forgiven her. But alas, her explanation was short. Quote, because of affirmative action, black people took my spot, end quote her spot. Or if I were to add all that was left unspoken in her sentence, if the University of Michigan hadn't let unqualified black people in, I, who am obviously deserving and qualified above and beyond those people, would have easily been accepted. My blood boiled. I really wanted to hurt her feelings. I wanted to suggest that perhaps she was not as qualified as any of the students who were let in, black or otherwise. I wanted to tell her that if I was one of the applicants, I knew for a fact I would get in before her and it had nothing to do with my skin color. I wanted to tell her that no one stole anything from her. That's what made it an application. My reaction surprised me. I had not applied to U of M and yet her words stung as if I had personally offended her with access to the coveted university. In my mind, she wasn't just a talking about a specific group of black students. She was talking about black people, all of us. That's why I wanted to hurt her feelings. She was telling me exactly what she thought about black people and I was ready to tell her about herself in return. Back then I didn't have all the terminology I have now to process awkward interactions with white people. I didn't have phrases like white tears or white fragility. And I'm not sure I even had, I had even explored the term white privilege at that point in my life. But I was learning about these things all the same, not from theory, but from life. That part. 
I super underlined. <laughs> Our teacher completely froze as the tension climbed. But more concerning was that four years at a racially diverse school hadn't been enough to challenge my classmates' belief that whiteness on its own merit made her more deserving. Our school's, quote, racial harmony might not have created that assumption, but it didn't help her unlearn it either. A lack of confrontation had done her no favors. That. As high school came to an end, I took this lesson with me and became determined always to question what looks like unity at first glance. Woo! That's hot fire. Ain't no friends here. Ain't no friends here. I love this. This was really good. I, and I think there's one other, maybe next week, one other chapter I'll read. I don't know. Maybe next week. Maybe never. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe in five minutes. I have no idea. But there's one more because there's a pink slip in it. That means I want to read it to you guys. I have to do the self-edit or else I won't do anything. Yay. Love it. It's good. It's called I'm Still Here. 